I'm Matt Winkler, Bloomberg News, and I'm delighted uh, to be the moderator for this discussion about whether Russia, and I would like to just introduce my uh, esteemed colleagues, David Bonderman, uh, Susan Eisenhower, Ruben Vardanyan, and uh, Carl Theodore, so Gutenberg. And what I'd like to do first is take us back a little more than a year. Uh, we're looking at uh, Russian asset values. And uh, what we see uh, in 2014, early on, is uh, just a, a month or so into the annexation of Crimea by Russia and the ensuing crisis in Ukraine, two very interesting developments. The first is that a month after the uh, annexation of Crimea, the ruble became the most volatile currency in the world for the first time. Not even in 1998, when Russia defaulted, had the ruble become so volatile. And the second thing that was interesting is that the Russian stock market, um, the MISEX, 50 companies, also became the most volatile stock index in the world, a month into this annexation. Now, what do those two things mean? If your currency is most volatile, fluctuates the most, that's a deterrent to trade. If your uh, stock market is also similarly so volatile, that's a deterrent to investment. So then something else happened along the way um, in 2014, something that wasn't largely anticipated, probably inside Russia and outside, and that was the collapse of oil um, by as much as 50% or more. And um, the combination of sanctions by Europe, the US, and other countries, the collapse in oil prices, uh, which is arguably the commodity underlining the Russian economy, all meant that when we look at Russian asset values, um, they plummeted uh, in 2014 to the extent that Russia was the worst emerging market of all in 2014. Now, interestingly enough, by the end of 2014, something else happened. Uh, the volatility of the ruble, if I could see the next slide so you can share that with uh, everybody, the volatility of the ruble uh, diminished, diminished to such an extent that the ruble was now the least volatile. And when the ruble became the least volatile, it stabilized and was poised for a rebound. And at that point, we were about to see, going into 2015, a rebound in Russian assets. Both the bond market, if we can see that, please, um, and the stock market um, have been rebounding since the beginning of the year. So uh, interesting that a year after sanctions, uh, Russia so far uh, has somehow managed to put itself in a much better position than where it was a year ago. And I think that's a good way to begin this panel. Um, and let's start maybe with a, uh, a question for David Bonderman. Um, is this short term, or is this signaling something longer term, and what to make of it? Well, if I could paraphrase something that uh, Tim Geithner said in another panel the other day, which is, if we knew the answer to that question, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> We'd um, be out with the daily racing form at the track. Um, so uh, I don't think uh, the panelists particularly have a better view than the rest of the world as to what's going to happen with the ruble or the volatility. But I think you, you uh, uh, have seen in, in our operating businesses in Russia that they've all been doing quite well, uh, which is a harbinger of some stability going forward. And why are companies doing quite well in Russia? Well, uh, uh, some of it's sectoral. Obviously, if you're in the oil and gas sector, you don't like where the pricing of life is. But uh, our biggest investment is in the food retailing business. People are still eating. There may be uh, some uh, economic downturns, but the sanctions that the Russians put on preventing the import of some kinds of uh, European and American goods have actually boosted margins. Uh, um, because they've been replaced with uh, um, uh, higher margin locally pro procured produce and, 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 and items. 
Um, so what we've seen is that the business has been booming, uh, um, kind of 30% year-over-year growth. Russians buying Russian goods and services because they can't buy anything else. Exactly right. Uh, and that's been good for retail businesses. Uh, uh, obviously, we're all impacted by, by where the ruble is, and the stability helps, but it's obviously a different range than it was. Um, but, it, but people got to eat, and they're going to continue to do that. So, Ruben, would you say the sanctions were worth it? <coughs> uh, before answering your question about sanctions worth it, not, I will say maybe just answering the same question you asked David. You know, it reminds me, I've been an investment banker of explaining what's going on in Russia the last 25 years. And I faced so many, like deja vu for me, to be honest, a little bit looks like the same story coming, 1993, 1995 to 1998. And it reminds me the old joke about the Boris Yeltsin when he was asked in by one of the foreign journalists, uh, Mr. Yeltsin, can you explain what's going on in Russia in one word? He said, good. Journalist said, thank you, but can you a little bit elaborate a little more, like two words? Not good. <laughs> uh, just going, going about your question, you know, one point, if I may just clarify for everybody who's sitting here understanding Russia, when you're talking about the stock market, we're talking about less of a million people in uh, entire Russia investing in a stock market. We're talking about 200 companies. That's why what's in the stock market is a little bit irrelevant. It's, we're looking like the market economy saying, this is the indicator of showing what's going in the economy. But in some sense, it's not, because like the currency fluctuation, for 90% of the population, we're living in a ruble zone. We don't care about how much dollar going up or down. We don't care about the stock market. This is why a little bit, when we're doing analysis about Russia, we need to keep in mind about this type of thing. This is why the sanction, come back to your question, is not good in any one country, but all these restrictions create opportunity to make more money. We all know about it, yeah? Putting restrictions, high, high margin. Some people benefiting, some companies benefiting. So now we turn to a, a bigger question, um, and this is one that I think, uh, Susan, you can address, and so can Carl Theodore. It's been said in a different time in the world that um, Russia may have lost an empire, not yet found a role. And actually, that phrase comes from a US Secretary of State who said it about Britain. Um, and uh, one wonders, is that something we're dealing with now, uh, with Russia? Lost an empire, not yet found a role. I do think that uh, Russia is struggling to find its role. And, and the losing an empire is something which is not only particularly connected to the behavior of just one global player, or just a Western behavior, or just only a Russian behavior. We tend to see it um, in a very simplistic way very often how this whole thing, how this whole thing happened. And then you've had success stories during the last 25 years, and success stories that did not lead to a situation where we found enough creativity of how to embrace Russia in an in, 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 in a prosperous way on one hand, and on the other hand, to be constructively critical towards what's happening within Russia. And in such a situation, it's extremely hard to find a role. And a role which is still, which is still somehow connected to borderlines to the Far East, borderlines to the West, the majority of a population that thinks more European than it would think in a Far Eastern way. All the different uh, incidents we have seen and we still see on the southern borderlines of Russia make it extremely difficult to find a role. Nevertheless, we should help Russia not to think about a lost empire, but uh, to think about a future role within a, an international world order. And just by mutual finger pointing, we will not achieve anything here. Susan, you agree? Well, I, I think you've. I think it's a very interesting idea that uh, Russia has uh, not found its uh, way or its uh, a role or even identity, frankly, in uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and I don't think it's been helped actually by the fact that uh, we have had uh, changing attitudes towards Russia ourselves in the West. We've had many uh, different uh, presidents, certainly in the United States. We've had. 
uh, many prime ministers. And um, the, Russia's dealt with a sort of evolving but changing attitude towards that country. There has not been a consistent strategy like there was during the Cold War. Uh, if I stand on the streets in Washington and I say to people, uh, what do we hope to accomplish with Russia? I mean, what are we hoping for over a long range period? You'll get 100 answers. Um, nobody has the first clue. And I dare say probably um, the uh, White House and Congress doesn't either. So if one asked you for a prescription right now, what would that be? Well, first of all, I think this is going to take a lot of effort. And I think we have become uh, generally fatigued because of all the crises going on in the country. I actually had a conversation uh, with somebody in the administration who said, oh, Russia was three crises ago. Uh, well, we're, uh, the problem is we don't really have a, a group of people in Washington who are experts in the area of uh, arms control, um, the, the, the geopolitics, even the, uh, the regional uh, potential disputes. Uh, and so we've got to build up um, that cadre again of experts in this area. And the, the administration and Congress, whoever is in power, has to start listening to experts again. Uh, this, um, what we have, is largely driven uh, by politics, probably for all sorts of reasons that have been discussed here in the last two days. Uh, but we've got, a, we've got a big job to do. And by the way, the arms control piece of it should be right square bang in the middle of the table. Just to set some perspective here, what is it we are trying to do? Is it just remove Russian troops, or are we trying to do something else? Ah, well, you see, we think we're just trying to um, remove uh, Russian troops. The Russians think we're trying to do something else. And this is the reason uh, the, um, the loss of a generation that really knew this field and knew it from before the end of the Cold War uh, is really sorely missed because to the Russians, they're adding up everything that happened over a 25-year period. Putin's been in power about 15 years now, which is way longer than any one um, political leader in the West. And uh, they're, they're adding up all of the insults. I would only um, just sort of bring this, my comment here to a close by saying we should not underestimate the geopolitics of humiliation. And uh, in the case of Russia, we need to go back and look at where the lost opportunities were, where opportunities are for the future, and frame a long-term strategy. So I was going to make a comment, yeah. which is, as in so many cases, from the Russian point of view, the United States is very important. And what the United States does is very important. You, you go look at the papers in Moscow, it's uh, and the US stuff is on the paper all the right. time. When you come to the United States, Russia isn't on the map. People are worried about ISIS, they're worried about Syria, they're worried about Egypt, they're worried about Libya, um, and what's going on in Afghanistan, et cetera. Russia isn't on the agenda anymore. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so you have a very skewed sort of outlook where one party is really wants to engage and the other party doesn't. Right. You and Ruben both have just said that uh, business continues unabated. In some cases, business is very good and continues to be uh, good. Is Vladimir Putin good for the Russian economy? I think in some sense, no, because uh, Putin is what is causing a lot of this tension. And in some sense, yes, which is, he has led a modernization in many ways. If you look at Russia today, as it was, say, before Boris Yeltsin came, and the, the streets are different, the housing is different, the place is, uh, is different. And um, while there's always difficult political issues, our experience on the business side has been that Russia is a perfectly fine place to invest. I mean, isn't it true that any country should want as much investment as possible? And how is he encouraging investment? I think we are, <clears throat> again, talking about individuals, not about the country. And it's, I think, one of the biggest problems in the West. We're trying to very personalize the issue about Russia, talking about only Vladimir Putin. And I think that Henry Kissinger said very rightly, said, if you're trying to demonize, demonize the Putin, it's a policy. It means you don't have any policy. And I will say, <clears throat> Vladimir Putin did a lot of good things in the beginning of 2000, when he made a lot of changes in Russia and uh, make this much more easier to do business and tax regime and attracting the foreign investment and many other things. Uh, during this period, he made some mistakes and made a lot of uh, things which uh, 
you can argue what is good or bad for a country. But in the end, he's continued very popular in the country, and he centralized the country under uh, government control. The question, I think, what you asked before, about what are the choices for Russia? Russia has uh, four choices. The first, rebuild the empire, which is nobody believe it's only because we don't have economic strength. It's just Russia is now regional power, which people are saying, saying West. Second, join the EU, become part of the EU economic uh, space which was rejected in the beginning of 2000s. It was rejected by kindly or unpleasantly, but it was rejected. We are a member of NATO, member of EU. Go to China, to the east, which is Russia doesn't want, but it's going now, shifting to that. Or staying as it is, and in the end, disappeared, because 143 million people, it's a small population, it's big territory, not enough sustainability to keep the economy. That's why between these four choices, and if you don't have a number two choice going to EU, and you don't want to go number three to China, you're staying between two, how rebuild the empire, or not do nothing and disappear later because the country cannot sustainably survive. So I think you're not leaving any choices for Russia or anybody who will be Putin or anybody else will be in the power to make what, he, what is happening now with the uh, Russian reaction to the expansion to the east from the Western European countries or from US. I'll try to connect some of those points here. First of all, we do talk about an individual. He is not one of the weakest heads of state around the globe. But we do talk about an individual who, is, who has a responsibility, of course, for a whole nation. But understanding this individual is a key element to understand, Susan, your point about humiliation right. is a key element to understand strategies we see right now may be in the eastern Ukraine may be connected to, to outreaches of the West as well during the last couple of years. And there I have to, I have to, I hate to correct you a tiny bit, Ruben, but um, it is not that the EU has rejected Russia's drive towards the European Union. It is not that NATO has rejected Russia in this very regard. It's actually the opposite. NATO has done a couple of severe mistakes, and we have to talk about those as well. The outreach or the, um, the, the attempt to have Ukraine and Georgia as members way too fast or at all was poorly conducted, and a couple of other topics as well. But Russia was invited into the NATO-Russia Council. We had numerous, numerous attempts from the European Union side to embrace Russia, to get Russia closer to the European Union. There were and there still are significant players in the European Union who would like to see Russia at the end of the day closer to membership to the European Union than in some kind of Ortakis construct, maybe a Eurasian Union or whatever. And I think we need to we need to be very clear about our failures in the West, and there have been quite a few, but at the same time also to be open and clear about what has been offered and what has happened. WTO membership, membership without any questions after the fall of the empire and the UN Security Council, it was not even discussed. It wasn't even discussed. We have, had, we, we have, we have without, um, without fulfilling the preconditions, we've had them in the G8. Well, that's history right now for the time being. I would love to see them back at a certain point. But this has to be point on the way, uh, put on the way of, of, of where to find the balance of how to treat this matter of humiliation. And instead, we keep blaming each other for neglecting certain emotions, feelings that are certainly given. Could I just uh, add something to that? I've, I heard. Uh, on very high authority, uh, and this would be worth checking out for the scholars here in this room, uh, that Boris Yeltsin had himself asked uh, that Russia be brought in as a full member of NATO and was rejected. And yes. I heard that Putin made the same effort. Um, and so the, uh, the mechanisms that NATO came up with were a kind of junior partnership, back to your point, about a former empire. I think the other point we have to realize is that um, the West decisions after 9-11 played an enormous role in what's unfolded here. Um, and that is uh, this idea of preemption 
uh, and regime change. Um, if you remember, um, Putin was very proud of the fact uh, that he was the first to call President Bush after 9-11 and followed it up with opening a treasure trove of intelligence um, with respect to Afghanistan when we um, went in there after 9-11. Um, and within only a number of years, a couple of years, we got out of the ABM Treaty, the United States did, uh, and then uh, all of the uh, revolutions on the, um, in the southern part of the former Soviet Union uh, were underway. Then we took out Saddam Hussein, and then it goes on and on and on. And so um, certainly many circles in, in Moscow think that uh, part of this sanction strategy is to bring about a collapse of the Russian economy so that uh, Putin will eventually be kicked out. And I think um, back in the arms control uh, lingo, you know, we used to talk about confidence building measures. We need to find a series of confidence building measures because uh, we are playing with fire in a country that is the only one on the planet capable of uh, you know, blowing up not only the United States but uh, the world as well. As part of the uh, step to building confidence measures, um, how would each of you approach the question, why would anyone want to do business with Russia? Maybe, David, you can answer that question. Well, um, politics aside, those of us in the business community are in, in it to earn a bottom line return con consistent with, uh, we're, in our case, we're fiduciaries for pension funds. Uh, um, and w Russia might be interesting because the market has fallen a long way. Uh, there's a shortage of capital uh, um, for good or maybe less good reasons. Russians are putting their capital elsewhere. That will tell you something, of course. But returns tend to be higher in places where either the troops are in the street uh, or the prices are low. Uh, and if you're a mid to long term investor, uh, uh, the Russian market um, has some attractions to it. Obviously, there's politics involved, particularly in the oil and gas sector, that you want to be wary of. And in Russia, as anywhere else, you want to have the right kind of, of, of partners. That's true in any country if you're running an American-based fund. Uh, um, but if you look around the globe, nothing too terrible is going to happen. Uh, um, if oil prices go up, the economy will be fine. If they don't go up, the economy won't be so fine. So you have to take those things uh, in, in, into consideration. Um, and, and then you've got the issues of uh, around sanctions, and obviously, uh, as a Western, you want to be careful not to run afoul of any, any of those. Uh, but the, the sanction is is really not much of a, uh, a motivator now, um, because the Europeans don't really have any any heart for significant sanctions. And Ruben and I were both at this conference last year in in St. Petersburg that President Putin sponsors. And for reasons best known only to them, I suppose, they decided to have somebody who really would ask Putin some tough questions when he got up to do this interview that he does, as opposed to getting you know some somebody local to ask him some nice questions about the orange crop or whatever. Um, they had a guy from CNN who seemed to want to ask the most provocative possible comments, uh, and one of the comments he said what he asked was, "All right, there are these sanctions." What do you think? Is that hurting you? Is it targeted at you and your friends? Uh, um, what do you think about the sanctions? And he said, of course the sanctions hurt me and my friends. That's what they're designed to do. They're working just fine. But if you think about it, it's two Jews and a Ukrainian, and I'm, pr I'm proud to call them my friends. Those are the people who are being impacted, so they'll live through it, you know. <laughs> and now, Ruben? I agree with David. Again, yeah, Russia being always <clears throat> interesting phenomenon for many of my foreign friends and clients. I mean, by margin, it's much higher compared to China. And I continue, I will know if people will be surprised here to this type of the, uh, statement. But if you look at them, like I, I made a lot of uh, in the direct investment in Russia, like helping McDonald's or Cargill or Danone or other. If you look at the way margin in Russia and the way regime of operation in Russia is much more favorable much easier to capital in capital back. Can cut BP. We can argue about this old conflict, but BP made more money in Russia than any other countries and made a lot of very high profit. And the end, it was a very successful transaction. Um, the problem, what all my Western friends said to me, is, Ruben, it's not a question about the margin. It's a question of unpredictability. Sometimes the rules of the game change, so unpredictable. We can understand what happened, why it's changed. 
The second is you need to pick up by story by story. You cannot pick up like entire country. It needs to go by very specifically by story by story. And of course, the size of the economy is not big, which is why for many investors, Russia continues is not very attractive because it's uh, not so many big stories, which like in China, it was so huge market that you can invest in understanding the potential of growth. Which is why overall, Russia has always been attractive. It can always make money, and especially in a it's a tough time if you understand right the risk and make the analysis and make choices. Again, it's nothing changed. All last 20 years was the same story again and again. At the beginning of the 20th century, hard as it is to believe, Argentina uh, loomed okay. larger Number four, in yeah. GDP than even the United States. And uh, we all know that in the 20th century, it was one disappointment after another. Is Russia going to continuously underachieve like Argentina? Is Russia one of the great underachievers? No, I disagree, Russia. By the way, um, I think some of the questions which we're talking about Russia, is we're always looking at oil and gas industry, it's like main. Can we go slide number 18, uh, number seven, 19, 19, number 19? I think we'll good show some numbers. 19, number 19 is showing something interesting for people from the West to understand what's going on in Russia. Um, if you look, what is the, uh, we're getting now 500,000 uh, households with annual income over a million dollars. And we are facing interesting situation which people in the West don't realize. This is the first time after 1917, this first generation of Russian rich people will think about the succession planning. And if you're going to page uh, slide number 18, I will show you the number of the companies, these private companies in Russia. It's around 900,000 private companies, okay? We're talking always about gas from Luke Oil. We're always looking at all top 50 companies. This is the bakeries. Uh, so we're getting the new class of people who became rich and what needs to do next 20 years to create this wealth transformation, business succession, uh, creating a philanthropy. Series. I think we are serious transformation stage in a country who just facing first time in a period of 100 years history what it means to be private ownership, what it means to be wealth wealthy people, what means to give something to your child. And it's not an easy process. It will take time and be a lot of pain and, 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 and problems and mistakes. But we are trying always simplifying the story about Russia, looking at all these oil, gas, uh, government officials. It's a much bigger, again, country, much more deeper, much more colorful. Again, like I always said, the example, asking how many nationalities live in Russia, people look at me saying Russians, and you know, 138 nationalities live in Russia and 15% Muslim people. Again, just try to be a little bit more under the country is really complicated to understand. And you need to put effort to understand the country a little bit. Don't, don't, simplify, don't try to simplify it all. I agree. I think it's short-sighted just to concentrate on oil and gas. Still, it is an enormous number of dependents, by the way, also for the Europeans. And that's also a point I would like to bring into the equation here. It's, I think, the oil and gas industry plus the industry you have just shown, small and medium-sized companies and others, would like to see a perspective of European markets. And they still need it, and they had that perspective already. Currently, many of them are shut down because of those perspectives, because of the sanctions we are in. At the same time, the Europeans are striving for energy diversity, are striving for options they may get from over here, for instance. It will take to a couple of years until we have the LNG alternative as such, maybe. That's another five years. But five years in which Russia will probably struggle with a lot of things. And I, one thing I just still don't see is where and when do we reach the point that Putin says, well, I can actually back away from keeping conflicts lukewarm, not frozen, but lukewarm, to still pamper a humiliated Russian soul. And that, will, that leads into a vicious circle with the Europeans, with the US, where I'm entirely with Susan, where I don't find many people any longer as well who do understand Russia at one time, at the other time, also the Europeans with their divided interest and our dependence we are having there and how Russia will bridge that very situation. Because we have to see clearly, at the very moment, it plays into the hands of Vladimir Putin to keep the whole thing somehow burning in East Ukraine and to keep the option open of Mariupol as well because he does know that it is a wonderful step to keep the West as divided as it actually is. We can talk about unity as much as we want. In our hearts, we are not unified. We keep together 
on very shaky grounds right now. And talking about sanctions and the sanctions regime may it end, well, we've seen first little signs of how easy it is to, to, to widen existing rifts already. The outreach of Vladimir Putin to a remarkable head of state of Greece right now was quite successful, quite successful. So let's see how that plays out end of July. I still think that the Europeans will stick together for a, another round if nothing seriously happens in East Ukraine because there we have to see the role of Greece as well. If they don't comply there, the willingness of the other Europeans to keep Greece in the, in the shaking Eurozone boat will be rather limited. So that's a pressure which is being built up there as well. So those things that have to be tied together. I thank you very much for that point about these divisions. The other thing from a larger, longer term strategic perspective that we should be concerned about is go read the lists of the countries that didn't support these sanctions. And India, South Africa, South Africa Brazil, Chile. China did not support sanctions against Russia. Now, if we're not careful, if we're really not careful, we can create a new divide all right, but we may not be happy about, about the way this divide looks. Uh, and so I think it's um, a significant thing uh, that the um, uh, Chinese president is going to Moscow for the um, end of the uh, the commemorations uh, of the end of World War II, um, and there won't be a Westerner there, as far as I know. Um, Angela Merkel is laying a, a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier the next day, which tells you that she feels under a lot of pressure to keep both the Russians and the Americans happy. So I think that the long-term consequences of this are much greater than whether or not Russia is going to survive in the short or medium term. Is bypassing the U.S., uh, looking to China, for example, good or bad for Russia? I'm sorry, say that Is again? bypassing the U.S., looking to China, for example, good I think or bad? they don't feel like they have any alternatives. I've never met a Russian uh, military official who didn't worry deep in their hearts about uh, China over the long haul because much of uh, Russia's energy resources are in the Far East and there's a big empty space out there and China's not that far away and they've worried a lot about that. But having said that, we're not leaving them with many choices and that's what I think is, so, is worth um, a, a reevaluation. So if the administration asked you for a plan four-point plan, what would, you, what would you give them? Well, first of all, I would uh, encourage the administration to uh, appoint a special envoy. We have no contact with the Russian president at the moment, as far as I know. And I have tried to check this out as best I can, and nobody can name anybody who's offering outside advice on this. So I'd, I'd uh, appoint uh, a special envoy. The reason for that is, is that Russia, back to being a, a great power uh, in uh, recent living memory, um, you know, still thinks of itself in that way and um, probably very much appreciates the interaction uh, it's having with Europe over the Minsk Accords, but basically uh, Europe is a more sympathetic place to, to Russia anyway. They want to talk to the guys who are pulling the strings behind the scenes. Um, and I think that would be a step. It doesn't commit the United States or anybody else to anything, but it is a sign of respect. And then um, I don't have, I don't want to monopolize two, the conversation. Three and four. Oh, two, three, and four. Gee whiz, I wish I'd come utterly prepared. But I think that's a big place to start. Uh, I think we also need to reframe this issue uh, and understand that this is a nuclear power, uh, that the uh, nuclear um, doctrine of uh, Russia is changing, uh, that if you read the newspaper, ordinary Russians are saying, why don't we? think about tactical nuclear weapons in this context, this is potentially very dangerous. And it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, so that's uh, number two. Number three, uh, I go up to uh, Capitol Hill quite often and I hear people say extraordinary things about Russia, which indicates they've never met a Russian or actually been to that part of the world. I would say instead of sidelining Codels, this is uh, you know congressional delegations overseas, we ought to send a batch of them over there to begin to uh, interact with the Duma. And then uh, I think uh, the fourth thing um, would be that we have to understand that uh, Russia is really not our enemy, that uh, many of us have been 
uh, predicting this uh, crisis in Ukraine almost since the day the Soviet Union collapsed because it was a logical place for there to be a flashpoint. Uh, and we need to look at this in a much more serious way. Now, that's a soft recommendation, but there are things you can do to back that up. So wh what, would, what should a business do at this point? A year ago, if one was walking the streets of Moscow, you noticed that almost all the police cars were Fords parked everywhere. Um, at one point, Russia was going to be the biggest car market in Europe. I thought, I thought exactly. the presentation was terrific, and I, I think the, uh, the comment, I'm just going to make this very quick, but I, I, I know why uh, it's great to do business in Russia. Um, just ask the astronauts at, uh, at NASA. Um, I wrote a book on, um, uh, it's called Partners in Space, U.S.-Russian Cooperation After the Cold War, and the Russians delivered for us every time, even when we didn't have a shuttle program anymore. Uh, so one of the reasons to do business in Russia is that when you build the right kind of relationships, they come through for you. I, I, maybe just a, a word on the sanctions again. Uh, um, it seems to me that the sanctions are perfectly, perfectly set up not to actually work at all, but to make a political statement. Uh, um, uh, the U.S. knows how to impose sanctions when they really want to impose sanctions. Look at Iran. Right. The U.S. could shut down the Russian economy by cutting off their access to global banking. They haven't done any of that. Instead, they've had sanctions which are picking on 19 or 26 different particular people for whom we have some, some alleged reason to dislike. But they're, they're designed to be an irritant. They're not designed to be effective. And there isn't any will to have uh, effective sanctions. So what, what they do is they keep people from going. See, if, if you go to the international conferences, which used to be half Americans, now you've got the Chinese there, you've got the people from the Gulf, you've got the Brazilians, you don't have any Americans, there's no contact, as Susan was saying. It's on the business level, too, which is just a mistake. Well, I agree, but it's a dilemmatic situation, and I think we still have to point out that we did have a serious violation of, of international law, that we have had and see a violation of territorial integrity, and such things need to be addressed. And I'm entirely with you. The result of the sanctions is that anti-Americanism in Russia has grown to record highs, that, um, that we do see Russia still being involved in Ukraine, probably more sophisticated than ever, that we do see um, repercussions also in neighboring satellite republics, which are rather negative and which foster new threats. We've just read today about Chechnya, for instance, which is lacking funding now from Russia in this, having been in this situation last year, better this year, it may, may, it may, it may become better at that, at that very point. But I think still the signal of sanctions at that very point was not the wrong signal well knowing how limited they are. If you wouldn't have reacted right. from the Western side, it would have been disastrous, as an example having been set in the Crimea and further on from there. But of course, nobody will draw. I don't expect anyone drawing the big card, which will be the SWIFT um, or the, 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 the international banking and transaction banking system. This has been already being called from the Russian side as, as, as a, for them as a quote unquote nuclear threat if that happens. And the Europeans will most probably shy away from that. And most probably as well the US. Last point, if I may take that off your point, special envoy. I would love to see a special envoy that has the capability or ability not only to reach out to Russia, but also a special envoy that knows how to play with very different emotions within the European Union. Yes, absolutely. The knowledge about Europe over here is, let's put it mildly and very diplomatically expandable. <laughs> and it's very often it's London or what I hear in business circles or, well, Brussels or Angela Merkel as the still remaining leader because of the weaknesses around her. But if you want to read European attitudes towards Russia correctly, you have to make a distinction between Polish, Czech, Hungary is a special case there, Baltic states. And France, Italy, Spain, who would approach all those things very differently. In Germany, right in between. And then a special envoy needs the backing and the power of a powerful president. 
to whomever I talk in the Russian administration, they tell me this is the weakest president we have seen for quite a while. And what kind of power would a special envoy have? And why, why, didn't we have, why didn't we have any contact on the top level whenever Putin, for instance, tried to have it? Last G20 meeting, right. APAC meeting, they had hours where they could just sit together and communicate face to face. I think it was about five to 10 minutes they sat together. Unfortunately. And it's such simplistic <coughs> or superficially simplistic steps that would make a big, big difference here. And that's maybe a message that could come also from whatever community that this is uh, one thing we think. But for the next two years, Ruben. Well, yeah, if I may, just uh, if I ask, you can ask your show slide 17. It's a Vladimir Posner is a very famous Russian uh, commentator. He made, he made the 10 points: what the West will get isolating Russia. And I think it was very good. For, I, I think it makes sense to read this 10 points because I think it's saying something which we need to keep in mind. And I agree, by the way, with Carl, what he said about this uh, in what needs to be personally also what's going in Europe, what's going also in CIS countries. By the way, I would say other point is people don't ignore fully CIS countries and saying, well, we are the satellite of the Russia, and whatever like this is, it doesn't matter, Kazakhstan, Belarus. Look at Lukashenko, how he's playing his own game, how he's trying now. Yeah, you know, Lukashenko becoming the Western friend and trying to become the peacemaker. And again, it's all it's like Assad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and again, how the West changes attitude to the Belarus. Anyway, I'm just saying it's 10 points. I think it's showing very importantly what is how Russia can be change with behavior. And I think it's, for us, people who are trying to build this bridge between the West and the entire world and Russia, keeping these bridges, trying to make communication, build, rebuild the trust. I think the key point was to disappear, the personal trust disappeared. People don't trust. And again, we're talking about Crimea, and I don't want to go over this political issue, but they started from the humiliation of the Putin field. He was, after 9-11, he was not uh, accepted by what he offered. But the experience with Yanukovych, again, nobody in the West care about, but they signed a deal about Yanukovych will keep his power and he will be uh, secure. And next moment they left the room, there was violation of this agreement. Okay, and after Crimea, again, we were talking about Crimea, like, but it's not happened like Russia one day decided to invasion to Crimea. It, before it, something happened. So I, said, I don't want to say who is right or wrong. Both sides did a lot of mistakes and not try to really build the trust that people can trust each other what they're doing. Okay, so we heard from Susan. What would you do? You were asked. <laughs> The administration came to you. What would you I'm do? not a politician. I'm a business person. I'm trying, to, again, I'm, I'm trying to build uh, all my life. I try to build the trust, knowing each other, speaking to each other, speaking, sitting, sitting together and, and, and understanding the... And I said, myself, is very simple. Russia has no future economically if Russia will not come part of you. Because Russia cannot be state self-sustainable. I believe, again, being looking at the situation in Russia, 143 million people not sustainable economically developed for the country in the next 20 years. Or we need to come to 200, 250 million people or more just to be self-sustainable. Or we need to become part of China or we need to be part of the EU. There's no other option. It's why we have a free option. Of course, I prefer EU. I don't have other option for me being a Western-oriented person. But to do it is a lot of effort from both sides, a lot of compromise, a lot of things that needs to be done. That's why don't push, don't push Russia in a corner because it's never happened. There's never good output for anyone in the world putting, pushing Russia in a corner. It's because what's happening now is basically this is by saying no other option for you, just expand, take Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, go and try to be bigger just by yourself and become more isolated. It's no option for the West. That's why we don't have so many options. It's only one option, how we can bring Russia back to the cooperation, how we can do Russia despite of the, all this different model of the management, different model of the uh, understanding of the rule of law and different type of the adopting this type of the country, which is very and not dissimilar like the Europeans and not similar like uh, US, but it's a, it's a very important union, uh, it's a very important partner for. Carl Theodore, uh, Angela Merkel probably has the greatest uh, stature, perhaps, uh, certainly with business in Europe and, and probably beyond uh, as a leader. What do you think she is thinking about right now with Russia? What does she want to accomplish? She wants to have Russia back in the community. And however you define the community institutionally, that's another, that's another thing. But there are many, many ways to find to have pre-accession steps. And, and that's certainly a goal of her. She would define the relationship to Russia also with shared geopolitical interests. So we cannot find a solution 
for the Syrian-Iraqi issue without Russia. We cannot find a solution in the midterm perspective for Iran without Russia. We cannot find a solution of the role of some players between the Middle East and Europe without Russia. Turkey as a very important player there as well. And then, of course, she does see the, uh, the breaches and violations I have just mentioned before. And she knows that she has to address that not only to her own electorate, but to a Western community as well. But she plays and could play a crucial role. And although she's very often very cautious not to act in the front of a certain development, I once called it the principle of being Merkel-Yavelli, and which means actually very different to Machiavelli to hesitate vigorously and to keep all options open, but to do it decisively and all other things. But there she has stepped forward. And I think that's, that's one of the things that have to be understood over here in Washington as well, that there is an amount of trust that could be put on Angela Merkel's shoulders. And she is not interested in ruining the relations across the Atlantic as well. She's a committed transatlanticist. But Germany's role is one that needs to reach out into both directions. And, and, and the dependence we still have when it comes to energy. And for the next years, definitely. So I would, I would actually trust, and living over here right now, but I would actually trust her ability to read also Vladimir Putin correctly and to give it the necessary time and to be critical whenever it's necessary to be critical. On that note, why don't we uh, take some questions from all of you if you're so inclined? Do I see any takers? Hang on, we'll give, we'll give you a microphone. Russia in recent years has been enhancing their nuclear capability, but at the same time, we decided against building a, a shield with the Bob administration. Now, Russia's in a position where, I think they even said, did bark if you start to build a shield, we may do. So, what is the possibility of them starting to use their nuclear capability as a threat or a bargaining chip going forward? Is that a major concern? Well, I do think we have to be concerned about the fact that um, uh, relations um, between our countries um, are in the tank. Um, we, many people don't realize that we're on uh, high alert. We have been on high alert since the Cold War. We never got off of high alert after the end of the Cold War. So we're still on 15 minutes decision time. 15 minutes decision time. If you're talking about tactical nuclear weapons, decision time is infinitely shorter. Uh, depending on you know where the targets are, so uh, this is a source of uh, a great concern. And yes, I think we should all be concerned about the fact that Russia is talking more about defending itself using um, nuclear weapons in large measure because uh, they don't have a conventional army. And this issue of NATO, which I actually think is central uh, to this whole issue, um, is is front and center in their calculation. Um, NATO brings with it an Article 5 guarantee, which says that the NATO alliance will defend any one of its members. And our defense capability includes everything, including uh, the U.S. Nuclear, nuclear arsenal. So um, the proposition of bringing Ukraine into NATO would be like bringing our military capability within uh, the 350 miles of Moscow. I mean, this is potentially extremely dangerous. And um, certainly, the Russians are modernizing uh, all of their defensive systems to the extent that they can afford it. And so are we. Uh, let's not make any mistake about it. So this is where the arms control piece plays a, bit, a pretty big thing. I did have an idea, by the way, on something else I would recommend to the president, is some consistency around benchmarks. Uh, this is what we have to do in order to find a path out of sanctions and the rest of it. We have to say definitively what they have to do in order to have that, um, those sanctions taken off. Many of these benchmarks we've established over the time, uh, and I could talk about this for hours, um, have been breached once they have met those uh, thresholds. So I think uh, clear thresholds, which could be uh, actually supported strongly by the European Union, um, would be very, very helpful. 
But we've got to find a way to de-escalate this because this just isn't a regional crisis anymore. Uh, truthfully, this is, uh, could turn into, uh, you know, I hear um, arms controllers say two things, a new Cuban missile crisis and or Russia going back to the launch on warning um, uh, doctrine that existed I am, previously. If I may just add one sentence. I'm also concerned about the growing militarization. I am, and, and you see a lot of rather provocative movements, naval forces at places where they actually don't have to be, overflights, other things, right. more than ever. Uh, that has happened before, but the scale right now is quite impressive. Second point, I don't, I, th I really think that Ukraine, a Ukraine membership in NATO is off the table. Mm -hmm. and, and there I give you the German perspective. We went against that plan in Bucharest in 2008 and there is no such thing that we would embrace an idea to bring instability and insecurity within NATO structures. But as you have said before, NATO, uh, Russia has tried to become NATO member twice. It's a big difference whether you ask for a normal process to enter such an alliance or whether you ask for a privileged partnership from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And the things Yeltsin and supposedly Putin, I hear other voices here, have asked for, were closer to a privileged partnership, which would have been unacceptable for any other NATO members at that very point. It would have rewritten NATO's structures entirely. So there is, of course, an accession process which would make sense. But you but know, Ukraine and Georgia don't meet the original criteria Absolutely. for yeah, expansion so. of NATO. And why the Bucharest um, summit right. uh, led no, this to this is why we were against it. This uh, is, is why this is why we said this is ridiculous to take them. It's uh, this is not going to work, and that's easily forgotten. Well, this is uh, we can only say that we're very glad that the German Chancellor is in the middle of this process. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, this is for the for the whole panel uh, regarding the BRICS Bank and uh, the uh, development bank with Russia, Brazil. India, China, South Africa. How viable do you think this is going forward as a protection for Russia, for its currency, and other bilateral agreements that it may have with these countries if, in fact, further banking or financial restrictions are thrust upon them? Thank you. David? Well, at this point, it doesn't look like there will be any such sanctions. The Russian banks are doing just fine, thank you. Um, both uh, Spare Bank has had a big run up in its stock. Uh, um, it was probably undervalued at the bottom, um, but I don't think anybody's worried about that at the moment. Uh, um, I just want to make one other comment. Back to Ruben's points on the slides that are still up here. You know, the, this potential alliance between Russia and China is entirely unnatural. Uh, Russia has been Western looking uh, for most of years. It, forever, forever, since St. Petersburg. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the Russians' aspirations are to be Western. They don't want to be Chinese. People speak, are studying English as a second language. They're not studying Mandarin. Um, the culture is uh, infused with American-based rock and roll music. And nobody, nobody's uh, playing Chinese songs. Um, the Russians want to be Western. Uh, and, and Ruben's point about forcing them to the East is right, which is to say it's entirely unnatural. There's a billion Chinese sitting just over a, an unpopulated Russian border, which the Russians have been afraid of for hundreds of years. It's not natural. What's natural is, a, is, is an alliance to the West, and we ought to be trying to figure out how to do that, uh, recognizing everybody's got their foibles, and Putin, Putin may be particularly hard to deal with. But over, overall, you're talking about a country, not a person. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. I, we'll get to my you. hand was up before his. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I've been to Russia three times in the last four years, and um, I perceive, and I've talked to a lot of people on the streets, and also I have some friends that are doing business uh, in what, Russia. And um, there's no doubt that, first of all, we know that every media that uh, the president controls has full-time people that do nothing else but deliver. Uh, interpret everything that's anti-American. I mean, that's their job. Make sure that everything that happens in the world is interpreted to the people that's anti-American, anti-West. So he has a purpose in that, because if you're 
a dictator or an aspiration to be a dictator, you need an enemy. Uh, the second thing is that uh, the Malaysian flight that went over and was shot down, I couldn't find one person in Russia that wasn't convinced that that was uh, the United States and the West that shot that down only for the purpose of blaming the Russians. And every one of them believed that. So now you take it a little bit further and you, you see the actions of Mr. Putin and there's no doubt that there's systematic jailing and murdering of op opponents. So that has to come into the mix in terms of how you treat this government and this person. So I'd like you to comment on those two things. One, the creation of an enemy to keep his popularity up, and that also motivated the war. Because I know some people in the inner circle said that Putin's popularity was going down. How do we get it up? We've got to create a war. And that historically, that's always been the case for leaders such as himself. So those are things in the mix. You can do whatever you want to do on this side. It's not going to change where he has to, how he has to maintain his popularity within the country. Yeah, it's not a question, it's a statement. And <clears throat> I understand how you make your analysis. But look, how many <clears throat> Russians now studying in abroad in the West? If it's, if how many Russians living in London and, and going to the Western universities? It's, a generation needs to come in a power. It will take 20 years or 15 years more. We need to keep this uh, dialogue with the opportunity of kids growing together and learning from each other. That's why it's, uh, despite all this rhetoric, which definitely increased, and as I mentioned this point, some of the people in Russian society will love to bring back U.S. enemy uh, rhetorics. Um, I think it's very important to keep this uh, border open and opportunity to, to people travel and see in each other and talk to each other, which not closed, not shut down yet. Second, um, I'll say it's um, popularity of Putin. It's a farm thing which you cannot accept, but it's 15 years. He was ab above 70 percent, which I think I don't think many other presidents got. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. And what is the how he made it this? But I'm just saying he was popular enough to not go creating enemies and. And, and paying so huge price for it. It was not like popularity went down to 10% or 15% to create enemies. I would say here, I don't disagree with your theory, which was the one why this conflict is started. And the third, I would say again, it's um, we're very easily blaming the other side with the mistakes or wrong things, but we're not looking at ourselves what we did wrong. And I think it's very important to be objective analysis what's happened with expansion. And the Boris the Gorbachev, by the way, was promised by James Baker and by Reagan, but was the no expansion and after Germany will go to NATO. And what's happened in 20 years' time is violation of his promise, OK? And you can blame saying it was not, it was promised to the Soviet Union, it was not promised to Russia. Russia is not empire anymore. It's, Russia is a small regional country. But the promise was not delivered. NATO expansion happened. And rhetoric against Russia increased also from Western side. And some of the Eastern European republics are very scared about Russia by historical reason, by what happened with the Poland or Baltic republics in the 20th century. And it's, of course, created not very easy dialogue between those two parts. But again, if we are not being calm, if we make a conclusion, a statement saying, this is the bad guy, this is the crook, it's over. And by the way, about South Korean airline plan, which in Russia opened, the archives is open. It was clear now proof, it was the provocation from the US, when they sent the South Korean air, uh, airplane in uh, 1982 to the border of the Soviet Union. And it's unfortunately now help Russians believe again this is the same story. And I'm, I'm not judging who was right or wrong, and I'm not, I'm not the specialist who will say what's happening in this uh, shutdown of this airplane. But unfortunately, history a lot of approvals with saying if you don't trust each other, if you're not sharing the, the information, if you're not trying to find the compromises, it's over. You're going in the wrong direction. Can I just add one thing uh, directly to the person that just made that comment? I think we have to engage with um, uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin because it's in our interest. That would be the reason to do it. Uh, it's in our interest to make sure that uh, the long term, our long term strategy, if we have one, is not compromised by current events and that we don't allow a situation to spin out of control where our own security is actually on the line. So I don't think this country should be doing things um, that aren't in our interest at all. 
but it is clearly on our interest, no matter what his record is domestically, and, and all of us are concerned about that. Um, but we're doing this because our national security is now in play. So would you expect the Netherlands to do anything more than they've done, apropos, since almost everybody who died on that plane were Dutch? Okay. And, and clearly the story. country no. has enormous investments it's in horrible. Russia. Horrible story. Royal Dutch Shell, for example, um, one of the biggest employers. Should, should Holland do anything more than it's done? I need to, again, we need to find the truth. Again, it's all the... Yeah, but the truth begins with also our cap cap capability to counter what the gentleman has just correctly said. I think the, the, the Russian skills of, of um, delivering messages right now are quite impressive. And just, just look at how professionally Russia Today is being made and how many English-speaking people also start believing what's being delivered over there. And there's no such thing that is as efficient right now from our side. Maybe European, maybe, maybe, maybe American. It's, there's every commentary on, 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 on websites is somehow infiltrated here and there by a, quite a strategy. We don't have it. And if it's just a strategy about the truth and not just about spinning, it would already help. Also, the business. The transparency is the best way, of course. Creating the transparency, open the. I was the only one way to create a build, rebuild trust, the transparency and honest. I'm afraid we're out of time at this point, so thank you all very much. And uh, Carl Theodore, Ruben, Susan, David, thank you very much. <laughs>